Hello everyone. Um, today, after the colloquium, we are going to, to have a lunch with Roberto. So we'll be at two in the in the main entrance, just in case that someone else can join us. Uh, we hope this anything we are close we will do <laughs> when we meet. Um, also, uh, Roberto will be here until uh, uh, Friday, so I organized two meetings. Uh, one which is for tomorrow uh, afternoon at uh, 3, and the other is for Wednesday, uh, Thursday. No, Tuesday. Oh, yes, Tuesday. Yeah. Thursday. Okay, uh, also at 3. Then, then Thursday will be in the in the um, So, if anyone can join to the discussion, please come and present any question. We will totally be informal. So, any uh, any question that you want to discuss related with galaxy evolution, with the star line, with the J five, J plus, or or slow, or any other. Uh, Khalifa or any other I mean, that's, that's, that's where <laughs> <laughs> we 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 happen to answer um like that okay yeah. okay well um this is on behalf of the directorate and also on the uh Severo Choa excellent program science director that must be here it's a pleasure for me to introduce um Welcome Roberto to the LA and uh, for this colloquium, for the Cellular Child Colloquium. I may say many, many things about Roberto, but I prefer to say <laughs> he told me to be, you know, confused. So I got this day is the Roberto P. Fernandez, uh, is a host PhD from the University of Cambridge in 95, some time ago. <laughs> and currently he is a professor of astronomy at the University of as uh, Santa Catarina. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has been, I mean, he's well known and uh, expert in the field of astronomy, static astronomy, uh, large database. He uh, has been in many places around the world. I would say, I would just to mention a few, uh, the top John Hawking University, uh, here, university here, here. here, he has been here, he's a fellow actually of the AA, and we are very you know, very proud of that. And uh, today, well, it's important to say that he's teaching now a uh, physical astronomy as professor in the university and has been also a coordinator of the postdoctoral rate program of the university for a while, for a year. And he is uh, very well known mainly uh, for his interest in star population, galaxy evolution, light database astronomy, and so on. And uh, in particular, I would mention. Uh, for the code the starlight and its applications. That's one thing that you uh, some time ago, but still. Uh, yes. So, and now it's uh, a kind of synthesis code for with the starlights uh, for more than one million, millions of galaxies, I would say, which is a very you know, strong merit. And uh, today he's going to speak us to stellar population and emission line with S, plus, which is a, a project which is the start. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Pepe. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. So, today I'm going to be telling about stellar populations and emission lines in in galaxies, of course, but as analyzed with S plus, which you may have heard about. For some strange coincidence, you have an identical telescope here in Spain. I don't know why. And so, <laughs> so yeah. So, and this is really the work by. Julia Taina Batista, she's going to be spending some months here starting in November, I guess. So I don't know what she's going to talk about because I'm stealing her work. So, okay. So but before, where is my mouse again? Yeah. Okay. Before talking about that, I will very briefly talk a bit about stellar populations, emission lines, and S plus. Okay. Just a few slides to refresh your memory. So stellar populations, well, what this is going to be the first half, the first few minutes is going to be about spectroscopy, spectral stellar population, then how we see that in photometry. So to build a spectrum of a stellar population, 
simple stellar population. This is from the famous paper by Conroy uh, 10 years ago. It's a basic recipe which involves things that we know. The IMF, we know or we assume an IMF, how many stars of different masses we have. Stellar evolution, here we have the HR diagram with isochrons from very young to very old populations. So that we also know. And we also know stellar spectra, how do they emit from one day equals zero to infinity across a uh, uh, wavelength scale. And you combine these three things and you predict the evolution of simple stellar population. Young stellar population, not so young, very old. Oops. And here we see this in, as an animation. What you're seeing there is evolution of a stellar population from uh, million years to giga years. So it's a logarithmic clock. We have all four decks from a million. Nothing happens before a million years, right? It's just nothing happens. Everything stays the same. Then from a million to 10 to 100 to one giga and 10 gigas, there are four decks of interval and the spectra changes. And it's also, so it's a log clock and it runs backward because we're talking about look back time. So this is how we see it in spectroscopy. And this is how we would see it in uh, photometry, just three filters here, but just to, to give an idea. It seems like a lot less information, much less information. So I'm using to do spectroscopy. We are all used to doing spectroscopy, but now we have to do with photometry. And the first thing we think, uh, no, we're not gonna be able to do the same. Let me, let's test that, that in this uh, talk. So here we have a bunch of, versions of spectra for simple stellar populations of di different ages and different metallicities from different people, including Rosa here from uh, 2005, Boulevard Charlot, a very famous one, and others, there are other versions of this. So this is a main ingredient in any stellar population analysis. You have to know how a simple stellar population, say a cluster of stars, behaves as a function of time and metallicity. This is a very key ingredient. Once you know that, and there's been lots of progress in the last 20 years about this. Once you know that, then you can start playing games like this one, which is, here's a spectrum, it's in black with green, right? Green is for the emission lines, they're painted in green, but it's an observed spectrum from the Sloan survey. Then you can start mixing the spectra that I just showed you of different ages and perhaps different metallicities. According to some recipe, here is a non-parametric recipe, which you know, with some some of the light in, or some of the mass or the light in young stars, some other in old stars, some other light in some other mass in uh, intermediate age stars. This is a recipe, which is non-parametric. In this case, it could be a tau function exponentially decaying. That's up to you to choose. That's a star formation history. This that particular one is produces this red spectrum here. It's the sum of SSPs. So the, from that, you infer the star formation history. And if you subtract one from the other, you can measure the emission lines. So this is what I've been doing all my life and I thought it couldn't do better. Yeah. And this is just, you know, you cannot do this with photometry or so, or so I thought. And these are other examples of results that we got from, I'm, I'm, I'm using my own code to illustrate the sort of things that you can do with spectroscopy, but uh, it applies to any other code, of course. It's the same again, spectral fit of using starlight, my code for galaxies of different masses. And here you have different star formation histories. Look back time, this is today, this is the past. And you see, just by looking at these five examples here that these galaxies down here, they have a the star formation rate has been kind of roughly constant across time. Whereas those in the top are, are forming much more stars nowadays than they have been in the past. So that's what, People have called double sizing just with five galaxies. I, I, we did the plot for other reasons, and it's all we can see double sizing with five examples. So, just an example of the sort of thing that you can do. And we've been doing that for a long time. And with, from the emission lines, you can do a lot of stuff, of course, characterize AGN, start from uh, metallicities, um, uh, nebular extinction, etc. Just a couple of examples the mass metallicity relation. What I'm really want to, to point here is this axis. This is a gas phase metallicity. It doesn't matter the rest, okay? We can only do that with emission lines. Yeah? So that's where emission lines are very important. So I'm not gonna go into the details of these plots. That's not really what, I, uh, what the talk is about. Now, okay, 
Can we do anything similar with photometry and with S plus photometry or J plus photometry? Or of course, J pass is going to be better, but you know, it's the same idea. So we know, I don't have to explain, you know, I don't have to tell you anything about S plus, really it's just, you know, the picture is different, but the telescope is the same. So it's in the South, it's a cousin of, another cousin is an identical twin really of J plus. And uh, you also know the filter system, five broad bands and seven narrow bands. The narrow bands picking on things like H alpha and nitrogen as well, oxygen two, and all the features in the blue. And what maybe you don't know about S plus is that it's um, it's uh, going well, it's about two thirds done. So one third left to, to be done. So this is the area which is uh, um, being observed so far, the green dots, the red ones are still to be done. So it's about uh, 60 some percent done. Okay. And some results, just you know, there's no time to discuss any of them. I wouldn't be able to do that anyway. Just to mention that, you know, there have been lots of interesting results on, on uh, environments, uh, some on the, on the um, you know, transients like GRBs and supernovae and some on ultra diffuse gal galaxies. This is a study in which I participated myself. Photometric redshifts, um, quasars, classification of quasars, blah, blah, blah. Stellar, the stellar part has been very successful. We've been able to find a bunch of very low metallicity stars in the halo. So, survey is going on. Okay. Well, let me come back to my question. Can we do astrogalactic work similar to what we have done with spectroscopy with Sloan, Khalifa, Manga, Muse, etc., with 12 bands and a small telescope? Well, so is it really, it is, it's, it's, the comparison is, is looking at this movie of these thousands of points to just a few, one, two, three bands here. You can see the evolution in color. So it's much less detail, but uh, somehow the information is still there. And I hope to convince you of that. So this brings me to what is really the topic of this talk. The problem is how to estimate stellar population and mainly emission line properties out of S plus, J plus as well. And basically, the main problem is really to separate nitrogen from H alpha because they fall in the same filter. That's a problem. Okay, so here you have an example spectrum. You have the synthetic photometry, and you see the H alpha and nitrogen lines. They're all here. They all fall into this uh, 66, uh, 6, uh, 6, 660 filter. So, can we separate them? So, the rest of the talk is going to be how we tackle this with All Star. Then the mission line base this is really the new stuff and priors. Use the trick. And simulations to, to test the, the idea and some results that we've gotten so far. This is, by the way, it's all in a paper that was in Nasu PH maybe two weeks ago or three by Julia. So, quick words about stellar populations in uh, and emission lines with All Star. Stellar population part is really the usual, usual stuff. No, nothing really new to tell you here. The emission lines is really the novelty. So all star is just like starlight. Actually, the name all star is not you know tennis shoes or anything like that. It's the algebraic starlight. Okay. It's only one L. So it's for algebra. So this is the idea. You decompose a galaxy or the spectrum of a galaxy or the photometry of a galaxy into stars of different ages, a little bit of the young stars. So some other uh, quantity of uh, yeah, intermediate age, some other quantity of old stars, so on and so forth. And mathematically, this is a base, is, a, is, is there's the composition into a base plus an extinction term. So this is a population vector, which tells you how much mass or light depends on how you do things. You put in populations of different age and metallicity. And these are the spectra that I've shown you before. Okay, the spectra that I've shown you before. This is a non-parametric decomposition. Please, please, please don't think that non-parametric means no parameters. This all is all, it's the contrary. On the contrary, there are many parameters, okay? Non-parametric only means that I haven't postulated that this, the transformation history follows a, 
cosine, an exponential, uh, whatever, right? That's all, that's all it means. There are plenty of parameters here. So there's a stellar base here and the emission line base. The stellar base is really the usual stuff. I've shown pictures of this before. There's a new version from some newer models by Charlotte as well. So you have what you have are spectra for different ages from young to old and different metallicities. So we pick a set of this to represent the populations in the galaxy. In this example, we're in this work, I think we're using 80 components of 16 different ages and five metallicities. Of course, it is highly, highly overdimensioned, but uh, that's not the problem here, okay? This, this, this works, this is just like the previous work we've done with Starlight and other things, and other tools as well. What is really new is that to that base, which is the stellar population base, stellar spectra, we are adding a bunch of nebular components to represent emission lines, possible emission lines in the galaxy, right? So, okay, we have the stellar part, it's fine now, we're gonna put the spectra to represent emission lines. How do I do that? One possible idea, and a naive idea could be, okay, I'm gonna have a spectrum that contains only H alpha. Okay, let's put H alpha, H beta, and the whole Balmer series together. And then another component is gonna have only the nitrogen lines. And another one for sulfur, maybe another one for oxygen. That's a very bad idea. I can explain you why later, but it's a very bad idea. It's simple, but it's horrible. <laughs> Because all the code does, sometimes it works, but the code only uses, when the lines are weak, the code uses these components to, to fit noise. You're always going to get the perfect fit if you do that, but it's mean, meaningless, completely meaningless. So it's really good to have all lines together. So each of these is one of the components in the base, okay? Each component contains all lines, not only one. That's, that's a key. And um, all, these are the lines we were dealing with, oxygen 2, O3, nitrogen, sulfur, and the Hobalmer series. You can put more lines uh, if you want, depends on the wavelength range. These are enough for S plus and low red. Okay, but how do we build this base? Where do I get this from? The idea is that I get it from, from nature in a way, from Sloan. That's a way to guarantee that the, my, my the emission lines that I'm going to derive are realistic. They may be wrong, but they're going to be realistic. I'm never going to find O3 over H beta of a thousand things because that's not in my base, right? So what I do, I use the BPT diagram and two H alpha O3 H alpha. It's just a slight difference with respect to the true BPT, which uses H beta here. It doesn't matter because we, it, the lines here are the redden. And we use H alpha because H alpha is gonna be one for us, gonna be unitary flux in our base, right? Just like a normalization wavelength. But this is really BPT, same shape. And uh, we pick 92, uh, 94 components here. Just chop it into boxes. And for each box, we compute the average nitrogen of H alpha, average oxygen, average O2, S2, all these lines. And that gives me the fluxes of all the lines with respect to H alpha, which is one. And with that, I build the spectra that I showed you before. Okay, it's completely, it's not a really a regular grid, but it's nearly, and then we put some extreme points here to, to cover the area, okay? So by definition, by algebraic definition, we're going to span, this, this base spans this diagram, this, this volume of, uh, covered by this diagram, okay? So that's what I mean that I'm gonna get realistic line ratios. So here again, unitary H alpha flux. I put a, uh, I've, I use Gaussians to represent the lines with uh, 150 kilometers in sigma. It doesn't really matter. That's, I'm not going to measure that with photometry. Or do I have, I, I know a way of doing that, but that's for, for uh, some other talk. Um, so, you have something which represents a metal poor H2 galaxy, um, metal rich star forming galaxy here in the bottom, massive spiral. Here, a retired galaxy or a liner. There you go. This is, this is what this space is doing. And here, but we, we don't see the spectra. 
I'm showing you a spec, but we don't see spec. You're going to see what you're going to see are these points, 12 bands photometry, right? Which I have multi multiplied by 10 here, just to, so that, that you can see something. Okay, we're not going to see the lines individually, you're going to see these points here, right? These are the bands from S plus up to the R and 66, J6060. Okay. So I have not said anything about the colors in this diagram so far, but now I have. This is the logarithm of the equivalent wave of H out. This is going to play a very important part in this talk in a few slides, but not to this moment. To this moment, the equivalent wave is completely irrelevant. I have chosen a base which makes no reference whatsoever to equivalent waves. It's actually, they have infinite, infinite equivalent wave because they have no continuum. Just zero, 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 and the line and zero. Okay, the equivalent wave has played no part in defining my base, but it's going to play a very important part in a few slides for a completely different reason. Okay, and it changes from left to right high equivalent wave, low equivalent wave. And we know precisely why that is so. This galaxy are forming stars, the equivalent wave is an proxy for the specific star formation rate because each alpha is star formation rate, and the continuum is a Basically, the mass of this basically start from specific star formation rate. And here you have retired galaxies and a few AGN over there. So we understand perfectly well how and why equivalent waves uh, behave in this behave in this diagram. Okay. Okay, before I talk about equivalent waves again, let me just show you that this fits work. Code works well. Very well, actually. The example for a, a, an elliptical infernox. You're going to be seeing spectra here, but it, this is just a model. May try to focus on the points, the black points and the red points. The fit is the red, and the black is the is the observed uh, photometer. Okay. If you cannot tell one from the other, it's because the fit is good, and in fact, it's better than one percent residuals. Oh, excellent fit. No emission lines, though. Maybe some weak H alpha over there, but very weak emission lines. This one is very different. This one is crazy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Strong emission lines. You can see the emission lines on the spectrum by me. Remember, what you see re really is uh, the black points here. This is observed. And you see that the, we were able to match it pretty well. Some problem, some little problem here around H beta, but again, 1% residuals. Pretty good. In general, the fits are very good. Okay, not two more, more examples from Fornax. This is integrated photometry from these two galaxies. Well, sometimes the photometry doesn't help very much, but uh, in general, the fits are very good, at least for the brightest galaxies. And it also works, you know, pixel by pixel in the galaxy, if they're big enough, they're close by. Like NGC 131365, we can do a spatially resolved study. What you're seeing here are again spectral fits to the spectral photo. How do I say this? Photo spectral fits, photometric fits. I don't know. Um, I have, you know, I always say spectrum in my life. So they're photo spectral fits to pixels, one in the nucleus, the other one there in the arm, the one, another one over there. Okay. So it, it, we can do spatially. I feel like work with. At least a few galaxies, though, just big galaxies. So excellent. The fits are perfect. The fits are very, very good, but that doesn't mean they're reliable. I can fit the data, and uh, can I trust the results? That's the question we, we should be really asking. And okay, so let's let's do this. Let's try to compare stellar populations and emission lines that we derive with those that we know. Okay. And what we're going to do here is going to use Sloan spectra, a bunch of Sloan spectra, I think it was 10,000 10, galaxies, uniformly spaced in, a, in a, an equivalent to each alpha, just to give you an idea from very strong line to weak line objects. Okay. From the work by Ariel, a previous student of mine, he's in Padova now. Um, this has been analyzed with starlight, usual stuff. Plus emission lines measured individually, basic spectroscopic work. 
Then to these galaxies, we're going to do the synthetic photometry. We're going to add noise, S plus light noise, which is larger in the blue and smaller in the red. It's about seven times worse in the blue narrow bands than in the, in the R band. I guess it's about the same in the T plus, I haven't checked. Then we're going to fit it, right? And we're going to compare the input based on spectroscopy with the output based on photometry. So this is the this is the paper that where I got the data from, Ariel 2019. He was analyzing the spectra of Sloan and galaxies as well. Galaxy is not important for what I'm going to tell you, but you know that's what he was doing. And that's where I got the masses, mean ages, metallicities, etc., and the emission lines as well. By the way, this work was a kind of a follow-up, really. To a previous work done by Rafa Lopez Hernandez here a few years ago, is still in the context of the Khalifa survey, where he also used Galax and fitted Khalifa and Galax at the same time. So, cool, that's me. Okay, let's go to the results. That's regarding stellar population. Stellar populations as derived from spectroscopy, and here as derived from S plus photometry. Masses, ages, extinction, and metallicity. And uh, direct comparison of the, of the results. And really, we're really comparing spectra with uh, photometry. At first, I was surprised, but not so much because I have done things in the past uh, with, with Russell compared different codes and different results. For, that was for JPAS, actually, for photometry, so more filters. But uh, at first, I was a bit surprised, but you know, this is really good. No? Point two dex uncertainty in age. Well, I'm happy with that. Masses, much better. Masses are always, is always easy anyway. And even extinction, just point, per, point 0.13 dispersion, that's pretty good. Even the metallicity, okay, there is an offsetting. But that offset, in fact, is not so important. That, it, that depends on how you define it. The fact that I can recover something which correlates with metallicity, that was kind of surprising, at least with optical colors. Maybe if, if, infra, if a, infrared was covered, that wouldn't be so surprising. But anyway, this is not new, but it's reassuring that we can you know, measure basic properties with a, with a photometry. Now let's go for the tricky part, emission lines. And let's start with the good news. The good news is not surprising, but it's still good anyway. The sum of nitrogen and H alpha, remember, nitrogen and H alpha is surrounded by two nitrogen lines. They are all in the same filter for low redshift. So the sum of them, their combined flux, is extremely well recovered. What you have here is the log of the equivalent width of the, the two lines, the three lines actually, together. Input against output, spectroscopy and photonic. And it's just 0, 0.0 nothing. Really excellent. Even, even if when you're here, say here is zero, that means one angstrom. Even when the lines are weak, we know they're weak. We can know, we know they're weak. When they're strong, the dispersion is even less. So that's good. People in J plus have done this as well. It's, with a different method, uh, with two methods, a three filter method and a synthesis method, it's kind of the same result. It's, uh, it's uh, basically the same thing. That's good news. But the bad news is that the ratio can be a complete design. You can do the sum, but the ratio can be a complete design. Not necessarily is, but sometimes or often it is. And this I have, I have two BPT diagrams here to, to show you that. And here in blue are galaxies as they are observed in spectroscopy. And in red are the same galaxies with an arrow connecting them um, after my feet. Okay, so what's happening here is that the galaxy was over here, it was right wing, and it was converted to the left wing completely by more than a dex. So the ratio is completely wrong, but the sum is completely wrong. 
because we cannot disentangle anything from each other. We know the combined flux, but not the individual, not the contributions of the two lines. You know, if you're right wing, you go to the left wing, that's good. That can be, good, at least politically. But uh, if you're left wing and you go to the right, that's even worse, right? Don't do that, please. You've been playing with this for a while here in Spain. Don't. I know what I'm talking about. So this is the problem, you know, it happens both ways. So, and the reason is simple. Here we have three spectra, completely different than two over each alpha, from zero to a lot, really. But the same flux, the same total flux. And what's happening here is that we cannot distinguish only if this filter is three combinations. Or can we? Can we? Well, here's a trick. Again, I've been showing you this diagram for a while. And the color here is the key. Large equivalent with low, uh, contrary actually. Low equivalent with intermediate, large equivalent with. And that the equivalent with is something that we get from the field. Not equivalent to wave of H alpha, as in this plot, but the equivalent wave of the sum of H alpha and nitrogen two. So if when I plot this diagram using that combined equivalent wave, and if it looks the same, then we have a way to solve this degeneracy. And this is the same diagram, but now plotting the combined equivalent wave. I was calling it one, but one is another diagram which I invented myself. It has nothing to do with this. So Julia is calling it 1A. E. Anyway, it's the 1A. E. Right. 1A e. is the BPT diagram covered by 1A, e, equivalent wave of H alpha plus 90. And what you see here is that the low, again, low and large, low and high uh, <clears throat> equivalent wave. So again, this thing, I know, I can trust it. To 0 0.000 dex. So if I do a fit and it, and it puts my galaxy here, but it has large equivalent width, then I know I'm, I'm doing it wrong. I have to fit, I have to exclude these elements from the base and refit only if this with star forming like elements. That's the trick. Okay. It, and I'm going to show you in a minute that it improves a lot the recovery. There are other constraints. This is the first order one. There are other constraints in the line ratio themselves as a function of this thing that, remember, I, I know this. So if I know this, I can say, okay, my fit has to be between this here and there. So I can only use so, such and such base elements. Well, so here's, here's how the code works. I run it once with all elements, all the 94 emission line base elements, which can give me completely wrong results, except for the combined equivalent wave of H alpha and nitrogen. That's reliable. Then I use that to select which part of the base is, uh, uh, is more representative of those equivalent waves. And then I rerun the code. And this is just like seconds because it's algebra. It's not really minimization or anything. It's just, there's no numerics involved. It's just fa very fast. So, let me see if I can make you understand how this works. So BPT diagram again, I'm gonna fit a galaxy, which is here. That's the spectroscopic value, okay? In my first fit, it, it, it put the galaxy on the left wing, but it's the right wing galaxy. But then I realized, okay, the code gives me five answers. The observed one is four, so it's good. Weak line, actually, the sum of them is four elements, so each of them is, is weak, weak lines. So if I have five answers, then I cannot be here. Five answers people do not live here. They live there. In fact, they live in this box here. So I redo the fit, but now throwing away all of these elements over there, just you know, considering those in the box, and I get a fit over there. And you can see a little circle there because there are small Carlo simulations. We can do statistics, can do PDFs. So let, 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 me, let me also let me show you that actually. Same galaxy. We fit it up after we restrict it, we fit it a hundred times or a thousand, I don't remember. These are the the hundred versions of the spectrum with the uh, with the uh, perturbations. 
these are the residuals. And this is what you get for the equivalent wave of different lines from O2 to H alpha, et cetera, from each of the fits. Those are just the distribution functions, but they work like probability distribution functions. It's not Bayesian, it's on the contrary, it's very frequentist, but you know, don't shoot me. It works fine. Okay. So, and here we have, for instance, let's see, H alpha equivalent wave in this case is 0.5, so it's three answers, about, about three answers. This is the average in plus or minus. It's right on the spot. There are line ratios. Line ratios are more complicated, but you know, just to just to emphasize that we have only not only best fit, but you know, some knowledge, some notion of the uncertainties involved. Now let's be let's see a different example. This one is a is a star forming galaxy over here, which initially I thought was there. Well, my initial fit gave you 53 answers, whereas the observed one is 56. And 50 something answers, people do not live there. Again, we live in this green box here. I redo the fit considering only this green points, and I get it over there, very close to the observed one. Well, that's that's kind of a, this is not Bayesian, okay? So it's not a prior in the strict sense. But it works like a prior. You know, I have some prior knowledge which I'm implementing in my code to guide it, okay, to reduce the degeneracy. And it works beautifully, actually. I was surprised. I was surprised to, have, to see how well it works. So here, what you have are input against output log with equivalent waves. So weak lines, very weak lines, one answer, and strong lines, 100 answers. For you know, all these different lines, O2, H beta, O3, H alpha, separate from nitrogen, and so forth. And if you see the dispersions, or they, they increased towards the, the, the bottom left, of course, it's a very weak line, one answer here. Yeah, O2 is even worse. You know. Below 10 answers is already hard to, to fit very well. But if you have an idea, we know when it's weak. It's not that you don't know anything, you know it's weak. But the numbers are really pretty good. About 0.1 or less dex uncertainty in the equivalent waves. And maybe you don't remember this, but you know, this line is in a narrow filter. This one is in a narrow filter together with that one. But so far is not. So far is not in a narrow band. So far, it's covered by the R band, I think. And H beta is not in a narrow band either. So how am I fitting these lines if they're not in narrow band? Narrow bands already know hard enough. That's because we're fitting everything together, right? We're fitting everything together. If we if we allow for much liberty, too much liberty on, on, on the, if we treated them independently, then we could fit them or not, would be, no, would be, just a matter of luck. Okay, some example results. Oh, to, to emphasize my main conclusion so far, so we can, with this prior, we can also recover the emission lines. Uh, J, J plus people, I think, what was the name? Logronio, something. Logronio, no? Logronio. Logronio. Um, they have done something similar with the three filter method and uh, some other method of the synthesis, some kind of spectral fit they do. And they found that, you know, a way to recover or to improve the recovery of nitrogen from each alpha, separate them, is to use a G minus R cover. So if the gas is red, you correct your number towards one side, if it is blue, which is kind of what you're doing here, but not with the color itself, with the equivalent fit, which is a more explicit, a more direct uh, measure. So, they are equivalent in a sense, okay, but this is more, more explicit correction. So, okay, let's go for some results. Just to illustrate what we can do with this, we can do stellar populations and emission work. So, just to close, let me start with a few integrated spectra, okay. Again, this is work by Julia that I'm presenting really to Forex. No. Fluxes, 
magnitudes. I don't know why people insist on plotting spectral magnitudes should be forbidden, but you know, I know Rosa likes it, so it's important. But I'm, you know, I'm still a spectroscopy, sorry. I'm doing photometry, but uh, in my heart, I only, only, I can only see things this way, you know. All right, so we have good fit again, one point something percent residual. It's a pretty weak, pretty faint galaxy. Another, another one. Oh, not the same, just same spectrum, but early types. Fornax is full of early types. Well, every now and then there's something different. And this one, mm, the photometer didn't really help, at least in the blue part. I don't know if I can trust that. So just to illustrate that, you know, not everything is flowers. We know that. Uh, at least the error bars are telling me that there is something wrong, but, you know. A star forming one. And I think that for some weird reason, every edge on system in Fornax has a nearby star. There's one there, there's one over there, another one over there, some cosmic conspiracy. Okay, let me close by showing you results for the spatially resolved part of the work, which you can do for big nearby galaxies. So we're going to pick a Typical example, meaning the best, of course. So again, example spectral fits for three different pixels, actually Voronoi zones, but um, with some butter word filtering. I, I'm not explaining all the pre-processing that we have done, but you know, it's not so elaborate. It's kind of basic, really. But um, so don't try not to see the spectrum, which I'm plotting here. What we're really thinking are the black points with the red crosses. So if you cannot tell one from the other, good. That means that the fit is good. So this is our data cube with 12 layers only, not thousands as we had in Khalifa, but 12. And these are maps of, again, masses, well, mass surface density, so solar masses per parsec, per square parsec, mean age from 10 to the seven, some 30 million years to about 10 giga. You see the young stars along the arms and in the nuclear region, lots of star formation in the galaxy going on in the middle. The equivalent wave of H alpha, again, large in the A2 regions in the nuclear part, low in this uh, region of the bar. And the dust, plenty of dust actually. Central part of this galaxy, which also harbors an AGN, by the way. We're going to see this in a minute. So, there's an also interesting exercise you can do. Here's the image of these three filters combined into an RGB composite. But we have the dust map as well, so you can de dust the galaxy. If you take the dust and you believe the correction, that's how the galaxy would look like, right? Which I guess is, I don't know if that's useful, but it's pretty good. Well, the whole dust lane in the nucleus goes away, and you see the you know, star formation is clearer. There's a lot of star formation going on there, but it, the colors don't really tell you that because there's a lot of dust. What else? Fluxes in uh, old populations, young populations, intermediate age populations. You can do this game. You see here the young population in the middle, surrounded by some intermediate, and along the bar, an older population. Everywhere else, oh, there are old stars everywhere, of course, but there, the young ones outshine them easily along the arms. And you can even try to do, you know, color um, composites representing different lines. H alpha, O3, and nitrogen in RG, in RGD. And you see. Um, pretty red. This is red plus blue, right? In the middle. So low O3, mainly because of extinction. And anyway, looks like a Khalifa map, right? Mm -hmm. Better resolution. Mm -hmm. Better resolution. Mm -hmm. 
no vignette, nothing like that. <laughs> and this is this is really surprised us. Is the study by Muse of the Venturi et al. a few years ago of this same galaxy? Of course, this is the nuclear part, one arc minutes. It's that little box over there. This is O3 and H alpha. So and O3 is in green, H alpha in red. That's from their paper. And this is our version based on S plus. We have a telescope which is a hundred times smaller in area, 80 centimeters and eight meters. And I don't know what, a million times cheaper, but better than that. Of course, resolution is not the same, but uh, it's pretty, you can see the ionization cone here, right? Not bad. And even maps of uh, individual, no, this is H alpha map, this Muse map, our map, you don't see the, you know, the many details, but uh, overall configuration is the same. The O3 one, well, this looks much prettier here than there, but you can tell there's something here, here right? I can, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I don't know. You have to have some imagination to see a cone here, but uh, uh, whereas here you don't need the imagination to see the cone. But uh, anyway, you see that there's difference in the, in the distribution. Pretty good, I would say. And that's about all, all I wanted to tell you. So the, I presented you the code, which has some old parts, some not, it's not new, the stellar population part. And the mission line base, that's new, or that's, I presented it before here, but it's improved now a lot with the, with the priors. The base itself is improved and the priors have improved it substantially. I tried to prove that with simulations and the inputs and matching input and output and the dispersions are very accept, acceptable for you know, photometry anyway. Showed some preliminary results for Fornix, and so far so good. So of course this can be done for J plus and for J plus. I think it's going to be much easier. Of course, the one thing which I have not said is that this probably, very probably, I, I am not one hundred percent sure. It goes. Uh, this doesn't work anymore for when H alpha nitrogen move out of the J six six zero two. That's in my mind. But Julia has done some tests and she said, oh no, it doesn't go completely wrong. Well, let's see. But anyway, in, in any case, with j -Pass, we don't have that problem, right? It just it moves out of one people and we'll go to another one. So, so I don't know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you, Reto. Time for questions. Uh, Rosa, would you manage to ask questions? Yeah. Oh. No. Yes. Please, people in the room, please uh, speak loud so that people in Zoom can hear you. And people in Zoom, uh, if you have questions, raise up your radio hand and we will open the floor to you ask the questions here. Um, I have a question about the Miss Online database. Um, just to check if I get the uh, idea correctly. So you use information from one of the PPT diagrams, the one that involves what well, the the version with only H alpha that involves H alpha, oxygen three, and nitrogen two. That's right. And right. then well, the equivalent width of H alpha plus nitrogen two. And you saw us in the examples and um, how well are recovered oxygen three, nitrogen two, and H alpha. But I was wondering about the other emission lines that are assumed to be like in the mock example that are sample from that diagram because for instance um, sulfur to emission lines can change quite a lot when you have one galaxy in that region in the BPT with nitrogen two it can occupy a wide area in the sulfur two diagram so you can have like different values for sulfur two with excellent point so we choose the BPT because it's the most uh, informative diagram of all the of all the diagnostic diagrams you can think of, but so a uh, point over there, the point over there, and all these coordinates are specified, but not sulfur and oxygen, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I played a lot with this, and in the end, I I ended up with the simplest recipe. Not that it cannot be improved, but you know, 
I pick galaxies around this box and I compute the mean so for two to H alpha. So this galaxy, this point here has only one value of so to H alpha. It could have two, it could have a range, you could have not an you could have you know another axis here for S2 over H alpha or O2. I tried that and it didn't quite work so well. Well, we didn't improve things very much. There is one problem when you start to allow much, a lot of liberty for these things. Say, for instance, that for, it, for each of these points, you, you, you allow three very different values of O2 or so forth, it doesn't matter. Very different, a very small one, a very large one, and a middle, one in the middle. Then what happens is that you're always going to fit perfectly the filter which has that line. Because you can use it freely to match noise. Maybe you say you're, you're fitting a galaxy which has no option, no O2, no emission line. But you have an element in your base where O2 is a thousand and everything else is nearly zero. Then you're always going to fit that, that plus perfectly because you're going to attribute whatever plus is there, even if it's noise, to, to a line. So for technical reasons, in the end, I ended up choosing the simplest version, just picking one value per B here. But you're right that there are variations. Yeah. If I understand you correctly. Yes. And um, have you tested like um, allowing it to vary in the, in the range, like for instance, for one of the bins in the layer? I have. The I have. Values of the I have. To I have. I have. I'm allowing the code to. I, I, have, I have. I have. Made versions where we have two values of S2 or two values of O2, so larger bases with more dimensions. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end, we've ended up with the simplest one. Maybe the, for specific applications, they, it could be worth it. You know, if you want to find some sulfur, if you're looking for supernova remnants, mm -hmm. well, not with this special resolution, I guess, but you know, but they have high sulfur too. You, you can adapt the base uh, to your needs. In fact, there are other things which you can adapt. For instance, the one of the recipe that I use, the way I implemented the prior, it's not so good for secret galaxies because they have, they can have large equilibrium drifts and be in the right part of the diagram. So if you know you're dealing with an AGM or you have some reason to believe that, you can do some other trick. Okay. But that also is another thing which can, you know, can, you can adapt to your, your needs. Um, congratulations on well, this very really nice work. I think uh, you are doing much better than I did with the uh, machine learning. Let's see what how it's coming. I taught the machine learning. I taught the machine and she learned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder, uh, are you using any constraint? Because when, when you have the cloud foundation teaching, uh, are you using any constraint in the real and width of a child with the jump stellar population? Since you have the initiation potential. No, but that's that's doable. That's doable. So what what he is saying here that if I if I must I'm in the star farming regime, I'm here somewhere, there is a direct link between the stellar population, the young stars and the H alpha. For every two ionizing photons, one will produce H alpha roughly. Well, that can be done, but if I have so there would be a link between the stellar part and the initial line part. I have done that in starlight, but uh, not here. And another question: um, the, 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 there was a plot where you saw the um, the recovery stellar population parameters, and I'm surprised that uh, the metallicity. Well, we have like a little bias in the metallicity, but uh, we don't we don't have. Bias in, in the other parameters, but this is the generic, right? So we will. Mm. Yeah, you're right, but you know, it really depends on how I define metallicity. What I'm plotting there, each little point is not one fit. Okay, I thought it would be too easy. If I pick the best fit, you know, these are the the, the, the spectra that I'm fitting. They are synthetic spectra. If I'm using the same base, that would be too easy. So I'm fitting the perturbed version. So what I'm plotting there is the median of 100 fits to the same galaxy. So that's an honest comparison. Uh, if I use a mean, 
it goes, it is better. The thing is that in metallicity distribution, because it's so uncertain, it's more, it's broad. So my, sometimes it has two peaks. You know, you do the Monte Carlo, sometimes it chooses this or that. So if I use the mean, the offset disappears. So I'm really not worried about that. Whereas for age, it's, it's stronger, it's, a, it's more robust. Mean or medians do not change very much. But you're right that in principle, if there is an offset there that should be compensated here in some other way. But it's, I think it's more a technicality here. And in any case, I'm, I'm surprised it correlates with anything. I don't believe it's metallicity so spectroscopy. Yeah. Still, I'm metallicity. Yeah. Yeah. Still, I'm metallicity. There are two questions from online. The first one by Ole Rizzo. So if you can unmute yourself, please. Oh, okay, thanks for the, for the great talk. Uh, I would like to get it clear, please. So can we, if we apply empirical prior algorithm that you showed, can we use line ratios to diagnose the galaxies, to classify them with BPT or VHN diagram? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was afraid somebody was gonna ask that. Let me see if I find something here. Um, I don't, I think the paper we have the plot, I cannot find it here. Yes and no. Well, you, you, you can you can trust n two over each other. And let me go back here. Let me go back to okay. You can trust the y axis here. So that's already a good thing, very good thing. You know, if you're dealing with an AGN, a retired galaxy, or a star forming region, all three over each beta. The problem is that you know you have things on both sides which have the same no have. Star forming and um, non star forming systems with the same O3 over each beta. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it improves a lot, but if you do a ratio, you're doing a ratio of two things which are have uncertainties. But if you want for if you want the, if you want numbers, there's a figure in the paper where we do the histograms for different line ratios of interest uh, and two over each half, of course, then um, O3 and two, that one that people use for to. Diagnose to, to use to estimate metallicity of strong line methods and others. And when the lines are reasonably strong, they're pretty reliable. But when you're dealing with a, a galaxy with low equivalent width, then, you know, as, as, uh, it's also true in spectroscopy. When, you're, why, you're, when your lines are weak, then the line ratios are not so, so reliable. But uh, you really should look at the figure in the papers, one of the last figures in the paper. They have histograms of the line ratios. Okay, message. thank you. Thank you for the answer. The second question is by Alejandro Lumbrera. We don't hear you. I saw you unmuted yourself, but we cannot hear anything. Maybe you can write the question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I had already uh, looked at the paper, but I got a, a better view of everything now, a very clever way of uh, dealing with the with the different line ratios. I am one of the J plus people for those in the audience who may not know. Um, and I wanted to ask something and point out something, I think, uh, about the... Um, the magnitude, or let's say the the flux, the the assumed flux in the uh, in the first part of the of the comparisons when you're dealing with your uh, simulated data and you're comparing the how can you uh, obtain the the emission lines equivalent widths and comparing with the the J plus the S plus simulated data with the with the spectroscopic uh, results and I wanted to I think reassure. A bit uh, Gines, if uh, if he was the one who spoke, I believe that yeah. uh, you are assuming a signal to noise of fifty, if I believe in the R band. Uh, in the R band, uh, but to what uh, flux or magnitude does this uh, correspond in in S plus? Whoa, magnitude. What's that? <laughs> Sorry, um, uh, um, that was a typical number for you know, the nearby galaxy that we plan to apply this to. We cannot go very far with this because of the redshift. Mm -hmm. uh, if you redshift the nitrogen and H half out of the band, then things will go crazy. 
So that okay. was kind of typical. And we have we have the, done the simulations for 25 as well. Remember that it's 50 in the R band, but in the blue bands, it's uh, seven times worse, I guess, in noise. The signal to noise, it depends on the shape of the spectrum, but so. So we found that it was a kind of representative of the sample that we had. But it, it, was, okay. a, it was just a test sample, really. It was not you know, any complete sample in any, in any sense. But we do have the simulation for 25 and also for 100. OK, because I, I was looking at the at your results, and I was really, really amazed because the, the, the correlation, uh, especially with the, with the sum of H alpha and nitrogen 2, where you don't have to do anything else, was really, really striking, like better than what I got or better than what uh, and Rafa Logroño uh, got before or better than what uh, even Ginés was getting with uh, with mini j -Pass. And I believe the, the thing might be related with the, the signal to noise ratio, uh, I assume. I was seeing that Ginés uh, limited it at 20 and uh, I am looking at my results and I, I don't almost have no galaxy at uh, 25. I'm dealing with the signal to noise of uh, around 10 and I think if you went down in signal to noise that would help uh, us uh, also compare when when we are trying to reach uh, fainter fainter galaxies okay yeah okay yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah in this sense it would be very interesting to make a plot of the of the galaxy that you show the the IQ like mm -hmm. a, a result uh, plotting um, by the signal to noise that of the of the of the, 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 yeah. The to yeah. The, to the yeah, we, we, yeah, we, like we, we did some pre-processing there, which I didn't mention, just, you know, apply a Butterworth filter, which kind of reduces noise and also some more noise mm. in the outer parts. So that, that improves things a little, but, uh, but we have, but going back to the point, I really have, I think we have not stretched them. We haven't gone much, very far in the noisy direction, the low signal to noise direction. Mm. That's probably worth testing it. But because mainly because we're really planning to apply it to nearby universe, very nearby things. Mm -hmm. To get pic nice pictures as that for 1365, then maybe there are three or four more galaxies like that in our service. Mm -hmm. Well, another sample in the mm -hmm. future. Uh, also, to, uh, probably you don't have any result from the image, except the, the quality, the but uh, uh, if you have a quantitative uh, comparison, it will be also very useful, not only the qualitative, which is a uh, yes. But, uh, I uh, think that uh, Amanda Lopez in La Plata mm -hmm. is doing that. Is doing that. For Forbes, for 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 they have, they have the mm -hmm. Forex 3D survey with uh, Mark Sarzi and others. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, she's trying to compare like zone by zone, pixel by zone, you know, arc second by arc second, something like that. What we did uh, visually, visually, I think we have a picture. We have a picture here. Oh, no, it's not the one. It's not this one. Well, this is a comp this is a comparison of maps produced with all star and the three filter methods, the three filter method of the that the J plus people came up with. But um, what I'm, well, just, just a second, just, ah, here, this is the one. So this is a news map. Flux of nitrogen two in units of something. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit hard to tell, but then visually comparing the figures, the fluxes were about right. You have to adjust for the pixel scale, etc. But uh, to be to do a proper comparison, have to take the have to take the news mm -hmm. cube and do the proper analysis. And I think Amanda is doing that. Uh, in that case, because the comparison also with the slope are really very very nice, but after all, it is synthetic photography, and the main problem that probably we have when to, to compare the result is that the the photometry 
the absorbed photometry will not really coincident with the, any spectroscopy yeah. uh, data. Yeah. Also, well, in so summary, that, real life is real life is hard. That the, 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 the limit of the of the equivalent width that in practice, you can use, yeah. in practice it's going to be yeah. But yeah. in any case, it is a really nice methodology to, to be applied to nearby tasks. Um, another point is the resin that you are using the spectroscopy resin. Yes, I need resins. I haven't said that, but I need ratchets. You know, when I got into this business, people yeah. told me, okay, we're going to give you ratchets. Photos is not are going to be perfect. Right. And the photo C, they introduce a significant bias. Mm. And that's one thing okay. we should do. Not so much for this nearby one, because you know the ratchet anyway, mm. but for, you know, for samples of galaxies mm. that are the ratchets, we should include in our simulations the uh, uncertainty in ratchet. If, this, mm. if it comes from photo Z, it might have a Substantial effect in everything here, stellar populations and emission lines. More questions? I have a curiosity just a follow up Yes. Roberto, should you, let me very next one. So, should you have a, a bunch of money to buy one filter or F plus or J plus? Do you think with one, if you buy and design one filter, can improve or refreshing your? So is, is that one filter problem if you have money or is it not one filter problem more? Well, I don't have that money, so that's a hypothetical. Anyway, <laughs> uh, maybe some, I don't know. I, I, maybe I, the stuff we have is, 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 is it possible? To give you the money. Exactly. Is it possible or is it not? It's not a question of adding one filter to the, to the set. Why I don't know, do we have a problem with the, what's the third filter? U, J something, third or fourth? Third nail filter. It's four in the list. Mm -hmm. I don't know, 30 or 39 or something. Mm -hmm. Is that bad in J plus as well? No. Because in S plus, that's ah, still bad. But I don't think so. Uh, well, the filter in the view in J plus. Is no, 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 no. Yeah, but there is one which is worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a third or fourth in the, in the sequence. That one you can see it. You, know, it, it, it uh, you can see it in Biotic and I do PCA. You can see that sometimes it has only one component for itself, okay. meaning that it wants to do what it wants to do, okay. regardless of the others. So that one could be improved somehow. Okay. <laughs> Anyway. But if I wanted another, uh, I don't. I don't think. But do you think any it would, big... adding one filter would improve uh, significantly, or is not is not a problem? Maybe. I'm coming to terms with the realization that you know, we always do this. Back are highly redundant, but I spent my life picking answer by answer and being very proud. Yeah. Of it. But now, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> maybe that was not so. In fact, there's a recent paper by the Spanish guy. And motor will have as well. Oh, sorry. Huh? I don't remember that. But uh, uh, so, you know, information theory speculations and saying that you know, apply to galaxy spectra, saying that there is not enough information, that's not much more information in spectra than in uh, broadband photometry. Uh -huh. So it's a it's an information theory mm -hmm. paper which I have to digest. But I picked this sentence there myself. A piece of my recent experience and disappointment, you know, disappointment, it is unhappy on the other hand because nowadays you know, we have photometry. Okay, when okay. you only have spectrum, you're going to see photometry sucks. Okay. Well, remember that you want to enjoy us for, for lunch. We'll be finally before two in Delta to go for lunch somewhere abroad. And uh, also that um, uh, on Thursday at three, we will meet at the Sala de Punta. Tomorrow we have also uh, another meeting that will be in the in the mini sala de, de, de arriba. It's quite small, but if you are interested, you can try to put it there.
Okay, thank you, Roberto, for the time.